Next on Unsolved Mysteries. Five people in a tropical paradise are dead. Are they the victims of voodoo? A vicious double murder and two missing teenage girls. Were they abducted or did they have reason to run? And a con man with a twisted sense of humor taunts police with a series of practical jokes. He calls himself Pat Brown. He was found by the side of a road, dazed and disoriented, a victim of total amnesia. Five cases, some without endings. Our team is working on them, and perhaps you can help. I'm Dennis Farina, and this is Unsolved Mysteries. St. Croix, the U.S. Virgin Islands. This popular vacation spot is paradise to more than one and a half million visitors from the United States each year. But even paradise can have a dark side. Control, this is 50 Echo, report a traffic accident in Gallows Bay vicinity of Memory. Just after 9.30 p.m., police arrive at the scene of what was reported as a minor traffic accident. They find a local woman, Radha Maharaj, apparently suffering from internal injuries. She would die on the way to the hospital. 16 miles away, another body is discovered. The dead man is Krishnadoth Maharaj, Radha's husband. The clothing of both victims is saturated with seawater. $25,000 in cash that the couple had borrowed was missing and the cause of both deaths, cyanide poisoning, make a total of five cyanide victims in the last four years. Authorities suspect that all of the deaths are linked to voodoo. Contrary to popular belief, there is nothing inherently sinister about voodoo. It is a blend of Roman Catholicism and African tradition, practiced mainly in Haiti and Louisiana. Curses, hexes, effigy dolls, and potions are more often a part of obia, an underground form of sorcery that is not connected to voodoo. Police in St. Croix now believe that the five cyanide poisonings were the work of a master con man. He practices obia, but pretends to use voodoo. He lures his victims into a vicious web of deceit and murder. Radha and Krishnadoth were both born in the Caribbean. Their parents came from India. The couple ran a small grocery store. Radha's two daughters from her first marriage helped with the business. We were paying our bills and we didn't have food to eat. We were all well, we were strong and healthy. And we were all working hard, especially my mother. Several months before they died, they took out a loan to expand their store. They soon found themselves in financial trouble. I've got the loan. No, I don't want to talk about the loan. Listen, All right. This time they were very month. tense, and especially when I spoke to my mother about what they were doing, she didn't like for me to ask her all those things. And she tried to um, answer me as quickly as possible and tried to change the subject. I'm sorry, I couldn't meet last week. Something else was wrong. According to their daughters, the Maharajis had been receiving mysterious phone calls from a strange man, but they wouldn't talk about it. Usually I answered the phone and this man would ask to speak to my stepfather. As soon as I gave it to him, he would ask me to go outside because he had something private to discuss. Yes, uh, $25,000. Then, three weeks before the Maharajis died, they brought home $25,000 in cash borrowed 
from Rada's relatives. It's fighting for that. She told us that this is what they had to pay to the gentleman. So I asked her, well, why? She said, well, don't ask me any questions. By Monday, you will know what it's all about. But by Monday, Rada was dead. On the previous Friday, she left home without explanation. For her to actually go out alone is something very strange for me. And for her to go out at night, that is even more strange because she didn't ever go anywhere at night. Never. 30 minutes later, Krishnadoth drove off in the opposite direction, presumably to meet the mysterious man. Two hours later, Rana's car coasted to a stop near a local beach. Her dress was soaked with seawater. She was unconscious and near death, but there were no outward signs of struggle or foul play. 16 miles away, Krishnadoth was found lying by the side of a beachfront road. He was dressed only in a pair of shorts, which were also soaked with seawater. Once again, there were no signs of foul play. The police told me that they believe that mom tried to commit suicide, probably because she and my stepfather had quarreled about something so very big that there was no way they could patch it up. That is nonsense. Autopsies of the bodies revealed that they had both died from cyanide poisoning. Oddly, another St. Croix couple, Edsel Striden and Carmen Torres, had recently died under similar circumstances. Edsel and Carmen had owned a small neighborhood bar. Like the Maharajis, they also took out a loan to expand their business, $54,000 in cash. Come on, honey. We gotta go. At dusk, Etzel and Carmen left their home in their pickup truck. Their daughter later recalled that her father had slipped a small bottle into his pocket before he left. It was the last time she would see her parents alive. Carmen Torres was discovered near death, less than a half a mile from the spot where Raja Maharaj had been found. She too would die on the way to the hospital. Etzel Striden was found dead in his truck on a nearby beach. Both Carmen and Etzel's clothes were also soaked with seawater, and both had died of cyanide poisoning. Plus, the $54,000 in cash was missing. The four deaths were clearly related and were linked by investigators to yet another previous cyanide poisoning. The first victim was 38-year-old Haig Caesar. Two years earlier, another car, another strange death. A young girl on her way to school found Haig in his car that had apparently run off the road. Hey, mister, your car! He, too, had been poisoned by cyanide. He appeared to be dead for several hours. There was no indication of foul play or any struggle. And we later found out that he had made contact with an individual that might be involved in voodoo. What he said is that the men had told them that there were three large jars of coins buried on the property that we owned, and that the coins were being guarded by spirits, ancient spirits. And in order to get those coins, they would have to get rid of the spirits. I can't feel something. Jumbo's presence really here, I can't feel it. There's a lot of gold on this land. Before his death, Haig apparently paid $100,000 in cash to an Obia man who claimed that he could remove the evil spirits. All right, don't worry about that. I'll come up with the money. When I found out about all the money he was borrowing and all the cash that he had taken out of our accounts and everything without even letting me know, I really was very angry about it. Um, and shocked, overall just shocked that he would have taken it so far. On the night he died, police believe Haig returned to the spot where the Obia man had said a treasure of priceless coins was buried. The Obia man's scam called for him to drink a potion 
that would drive away the spirits guarding the coins. That potion turned out to be cyanide. By the time Haig's body was discovered the next day, both the Obia man and the $100,000 had vanished. I knew that he was aware of Obia and voodoo. I mean, most people who live in the islands are. I thought he was smart enough, intelligent enough, aware enough to know that, you know, it wasn't real. Were all five deaths the work of an Obia man? I'm a poor son. Was the man who promised buried treasure to Haig Caesar, the same man who telephoned the Maharajis. 25,000, you gotta go. Was he also the man Edso Striden and Cameron Torres went to meet on the night they died? The similarities in all three cases go far beyond mere coincidence. It's very hard to understand why people would want to cheat and kill. And if somebody doesn't find him, then I don't believe that there is any justice in this world. The man who has murdered five people on St. Croix is believed to travel throughout the Caribbean and even into the United States. He speaks with a heavy French West Indian accent. If you have any information about this case, please log on to our website at unsolved.com. Next. On the night her parents were murdered, a teenage girl and her friend go missing. Venita, Oklahoma, a small rural town in Craig County. Ashley Freeman turns sweet 16. It's a night of celebration for her parents and for her best friend, Laura Bible. Laura, she said to me, Daddy, is it all right if I spend the night with Ashley to the Freeman's home? I said, well, so just make sure you're home by noon tomorrow. And uh, noon tomorrow didn't happen the way it should have. Sometime during the night, the Freeman's home became an inferno. By the time Laura's parents arrive, the fire is out, but Ashley Freeman's home has been reduced to ashes. There's a car. Laura's car is still there, but there is no sign of their daughter. Jay and Lorreen Bible fear the worst. We did find one body, Who? but it's not Laura. I can't. The county coroner told me that there was only one body is all they found. I said, have they found any, any, anybody else? And she said, no, we've looked, but there's no other bodies there. The body is Kathy Freeman's, the mother of Laura's best friend, Ashley. But where are Ashley, her father, Danny, and Laura Bible? We only had one body accounted for, could find no others, yet we had all the cars there at the house. That was, that was a little bit bizarre, and no one could quite piece two and two together on that. It didn't make any sense. One person dead and three missing. The case became even more baffling when the coroner determined that Kathy Freeman did not die in the fire, but from a shotgun wound to the head. And then the arson squad concluded that the blaze was deliberately set. Laura and Ashley had been best friends since kindergarten. Laura and Ashley call each other at least once a week. What one was thinking, the other was thinking. It's kind of like when two people, one can finish the sentence when the other one starts one. The day after the fire, Laura's parents returned to the crime scene. They had hoped to find a clue investigators missed. Oh, no. After only oh, wow. five minutes. Lorraine, come here, quick. Oh, it no. was more than a clue. It was a body burned almost beyond recognition. But it wasn't Laura or Ashley. It was an adult male. He did not have anything from the upper teeth all the way to the top of his head. It was totally gone, like he'd been shot in the face. We just couldn't believe that they had overlooked a second body in this fire. The body was identified as Danny Freeman, Kathy's husband. And like Kathy, he had been shot at close range with a shotgun. 
Investigators re-examined the crime scene. No other bodies were found, but they did find one important clue. Laura's purse. Laura's purse. Honey. In it were her driver's license and nearly $200 in cash. Why would Laura leave her purse unless she had been abducted? I feel that somebody had went in there for whatever reason, murdered Denny and Kathy and took the girls. The Craig County Sheriff's Department tried to piece together what happened the night of Ashley's birthday. If it had been a robbery, the purse would have been taken. And if murder was the motive, who had reason to kill Danny and Kathy Freeman, Ashley's parents? Danny himself may have had the answer, which he revealed to his brother, Dwayne. Listen, Dwayne, if anything should ever happen to me, I want you to take a look at the sheriff's office. Sheriff, what? He put his finger in my face and he said, if anything ever happens to me, look at the sheriff's department. And he was serious, he was in my face to drive it home with me. For months, it had been rumored that the Craig County Sheriff's Department was feuding with the Freemans. It all began when Danny's son, Shane, was shot and killed by a deputy after he had stolen a truck and a neighbor's gun. Shane's killing was ruled justifiable, but the Freemans threatened to file a wrongful death lawsuit against the Sheriff's Department. Some say that the deputies started to intimidate the Freemans. Get out of the truck, Danny. What is this about? This is about you looking all over town for deputies. He was basically told, according to Danny, that they could do anything they wanted to to him and his family and there wasn't a thing he could do about it. You're taking yourself out of the investigation. When Danny and Kathy Freeman were found dead, the Craig County Sheriff's Department voluntarily turned the case over to the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation. They also consented to polygraph tests. Then all cleared themselves as a result of those examinations. The overall conclusion of our efforts was that the Sheriff's Office had nothing to do with the murders of Danny and Kathy and did not know the whereabouts of the two missing girls. Another possibility. According to an informant, Danny Freeman met with two unidentified men a couple of weeks before his murder. One was clearly unwelcome. What's he doing here? We just got some things we want to talk about. Some people said that Danny was a small-time drug trafficker. I'm not dealing with you while he's here, so you can just take off. Danny. Could a drug deal gone bad have resulted in a double murder? If you wanted to consider that it was drug related and nothing fits correctly, the very last thing that the people who committed the murder would want to do would be abduct the children. There is another possibility, perhaps the most disturbing theory of all. Ashley Freeman murdered her own parents and then fled with Laura. There was a great deal of friction in the Freeman household. Danny and his daughter did not get along well at all and hadn't for some time. That's something we can't overlook. I find it difficult to believe that the girls by themselves could hide out that long and not be found. Jay and Lorene Bible were left with only unanswered questions. Where were Laura and Ashley, and why had they left? We have come to the conclusion that Laura is in the wrong place at the wrong time. I do feel that she's still alive, but whether she's alive or dead, I want to know. You know, we love her dearly and wish we could have her back, wish we could have both girls back, because at this point I've taken and raised them both and never let them go. Update. There are new developments in this case. Here's one of our staff with details. Thanks to tips from witnesses, three suspects have been identified in the murders of Danny and Kathy Freeman and the kidnapping murders of Ashley Freeman and Laura Bible. Several witnesses claim that three men Ronnie Dean Busick, Warren Welch, and David Pennington allegedly bragged about raping and murdering the two girls after holding them captive in Welch's trailer for three days. Ronnie Dean Busick was charged with four counts of first-degree murder. Busick met with family members but was not helpful in locating the girls' remains. It has been claimed that the girls' bodies were hidden in a nearby mine shaft, but they have never been found. Busick pleaded guilty and was sentenced to 10 years in prison. Next, 
The story of a clever and slippery con man who eludes authorities over and over again. The Hawaiian island of Maui. A man arrives at a local bank and introduces himself as Pepito de Bayon. I've been named representative to my aunt's estate. And what I'd like to do is take the funds from her account and open up a new account. In addition to the $52,000 from her account, I'd like to deposit this check also. Do you have some identification? And also, I'd there was something about the smooth talking customer that made the bank manager suspicious. If you could come back in an hour, we'll be all ready for you to go when you come back. OK. Great. And I guess I'll see you in around an hour. Yes. An hour later, the man returned as scheduled. Are you Pepito de Bayan? Yeah, that's me. You believe this check is a forgery? You're in the He's arrested on suspicion of forgery. At first, Maui police have no idea who they have in custody. The suspect carries 15 identification cards, each with a different alias. But eventually, their prisoner is identified as the elusive con man known as Todd Mueller. Todd Mueller specialized in forging court documents. He used them to steal money from the estates of people who had recently died. Mueller was also something of a practical joker. He enjoyed taunting anyone who tried to keep Todd Mueller behind bars. Honolulu, Hawaii. Hello. My name is Clara. Hi, Clara. How are you? I'm Arthur Iona. Only a few months after his arrest in Maui, Todd Mueller was out on bail and back on the scam. This time, he was calling himself Arthur Iona. We think Todd Mueller looked in a newspaper. From there, he would get names of deceased persons, their accounts being in probate court. He would then go over to the copying machines located right in circuit court. Then he would make up letters of administration, naming him the trustee for the account. I've been a personal representative to the estate of George McLaughlin. And what I'd like to do is take the funds from this account and open a checking account in my name. May I see some ID? Absolutely. Three days after he opened the account, Mueller returned to the bank in Honolulu and withdrew more than $31,000. This instantly aroused the suspicions of the bank manager, who acted quickly. She called me to tell me that she thought these probate documents were false. She described the individual to me. I immediately thought, Todd Mueller. Todd Mueller? Detective Lubrigo. Yeah, finally me. Hi. You're under arrest for forgery? Chance be on your back? After the arrest, Detective Nobriga went to the home address that Mueller had given him. Once he was sure that Mueller lived there, Nobriga left get to get a search warrant. warrant. Meanwhile, Todd Mueller posted bail and was gone, but not out of touch. Todd Mueller calls me in my office. He tells me, you don't have to make any search warrants. Just come over to my house and I'll let you look around. But Todd Mueller had cleared out of his house. I just kind of smiled and thought, well, he's leading me on a wild goose chase. And where was Todd Mueller? Living it up 5,000 miles away in an exclusive hotel in Chicago. Hi, it's 1720. I want a paper tonight, tomorrow. I'm not sure when I'll be checking out. Mr. Mueller? Yeah. We became suspicious of Mr. Mueller. He had very suspicious looking people coming to the hotel and he was uh, giving large sums of money uh, to them. And I informed the front office manager that we should not extend this day. The hotel's booked? That's correct. Are you sure there isn't some mistake? I've been here all week. I'm afraid not. Mueller, however, wasn't quite ready to leave. He simply called the hotel's reservation service and booked another room across the hall. That irked me, <laughs> uh, to say the least. And at that point, that's when I felt that we should take some sort of action. Pat Amiano searched Mueller's vacated room. He found several discarded checks, which later proved to be forgeries. Amiano also discovered that Mueller had placed several calls to Honolulu, Hawaii. He called one of the phone numbers, and it happened to be my office. 
I think he just has this penchant for uh, making everyone chase him around, you know. Pat Amiano called the police. When they arrived, Mueller wasn't around, but his cellmate from Hawaii, Roy Hartsock, was. Authorities discovered that Hartsock's release documents had been forged by Todd Mueller. Do you have any identification? Yeah. Todd Mueller? Chicago PD, you're under arrest. Once again, Mueller was in custody, but this time there would be no bail. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say? Todd was parading around town prior to his arrest, pretending to be someone other than what he was, committed several burglaries, stole mail, opened bank accounts, and attempted to withdraw some of $204,000 from one account. Roy Hartsock was returned to Hawaii to complete his sentence. Todd Mueller was booked on charges of forgery, fraud, and robbery. He was held in the Cook County Jail pending trial. But Mueller had one more trick up his sleeve. After six months behind bars, he told guards that he had swallowed a razor blade. He was immediately rushed to an emergency room. Mueller was handcuffed to his hospital bed. A guard was posted outside the door, but it didn't do a bit of good. Authorities still can't explain how Mueller got away. I don't particularly enjoy what he's doing, but I just think what he's doing is silly. You know, eventually he's gonna get caught. Update. As predicted, Todd Mueller was caught again, this time in New Jersey. And now, he was using his real name, David Livingston. Livingston, alias Mueller, alias Pepito de Bion, alias Arthur Iona, was tried and convicted of wire fraud. He was sentenced to 11 years and three months in prison. Coming up, a man's vivid dream of being in prison by enemy soldiers comes true for one of his best friends. On a previous broadcast, we featured a murder in Athens, Georgia. During the early morning hours, a stranger entered the home of a restaurant owner named T.K. Hardy. Hardy was apparently the victim of a contract hit. The prime suspect in the case was John Mooney, a rival restaurant owner who had a long running feud with Hardy. Would y'all decide to Police learned that a man named Elmo Florence had bragged about killing T.K. Hardy. You're a what? I'm a hit man. Yeah. And said John Mooney paid him to do it. Elmo Florence was convicted of first degree murder. John Mooney was also convicted of first degree murder and was sentenced to life in a maximum security prison. But three months later, he was transferred to a minimum security facility and escaped. Update, Scottsdale, Arizona. Within minutes of our broadcast, two viewers called us to report that John Mooney was living in this house under the assumed name Robert J. Kelly. John Mooney, alias Robert Kelly, was arrested at his home by the Mesa police. He had been working as an accountant for several companies in the Scottsdale area. Over nine years after he escaped, John Mooney was returned to Georgia. He served his time and has been released. At one time or another, most of us have had a dream so intense, so vivid, that we felt it had to be real. Few, though, have ever discovered that the dream actually was real. Even fewer have had the spine-tingling experience of the man you're about to meet. Kuwait, the Middle East. January 1991, Desert Storm. The conflict was instantly seen on television sets around the world. I would like to see a peaceful solution to this question. I think Saddam Hussein should fully Joe O'Brien of Crestline, California, watched with special interest. 
One of the Kuwaiti jet pilots fighting with the Allied forces was his longtime friend, Muhammad Mubarak, nicknamed Sammy. They had met 16 years before when Sammy was in the United States on a training mission. They had been friends ever since. During the hours of darkness, Baghdad was bombed by Allied warplanes. Wait, hold on. Joe had no doubt that Sammy would be in the middle of the fighting. I'm going to have to call you back. But he was stunned to see his friend's face right there on television. The Iraqis had shot down Sammy's plane and taken him prisoner. It was like my blood turned to lead. I think my biggest concern when he was shot down was that Saddam Hussein would make an example out of him. Uh, Iraq's issue was with Kuwait, so we have a Kuwaiti pilot. Uh, we will, if they were to torture or kill him, uh, uh, that was my main concern. That night, Joe had a bizarre dream. In my dream, I was very much aware that I was Sammy. I was in his cell, and I was seeing things through his eyes. It was a fairly small cell with a high ceiling. The floor was very cold. I noticed the color was almost like a dark, flat porcelain. Uh, it had on a maroon, uh, took on a maroon or a purplish color when the light was on. I remember being very uncomfortable. But the pain I had in my hands almost overrode everything else about my captivity. It was so painful. My hands were on fire. In his dream, Joe had a powerful feeling about what seemed to be an ordinary striped blanket. I was very happy to have it. But I remember studying the material and the design. And it was shortly after that when I woke up in a cold sweat. I've never had a dream like that, and I've never woken up like that before. And I, I immediately got out of bed. It was about 6 o'clock, and I went right in to the bathroom to run some water on my wrists, which were very, very sore. That morning, Joe met a friend, John Goff, for breakfast. Hey, Joe, how's it going? Hey, how are you? All right. Big night. Yeah, I'm sure. When he showed up, I noticed that his hands were kind of red. And he had a tough time picking his coffee cup up. And he says, the, the darndest thing happened to me last night. I, I had this strange dream. And in the process of my dream, um, my hands started hurting. And so then he told me about the dream. Your friend is a Kuwaiti pilot? Yeah. Yeah, I dreamed I was him in his cell. Joe O'Brien is not a person to just fabricate stories. And when he told me about this story, I really did think that there, it was something really unusual. He explained in detail about a prisoner of war, and the pain of his hands didn't go away for five days. Well, you know someone's captive, you're going to picture a cell. But why the pain, and why in my wrists? Uh, you know, I, I've, I used to be a mason. I have strong hands. I've never had problems with my hands. And here I can't even hold a coffee cup. 42 days after the war began, Iraq surrendered. Saddam Hussein agreed to a ceasefire and an exchange of prisoners. Joe again saw Sammy's face on television. When I saw Sammy actually being released, I couldn't believe it. I was just so happy. I called him that night. He was in the hospital and had a wonderful conversation with him and was very happy. It was a, it was a, a good day. Sammy. Joseph, my friend, how are you? The following Christmas, they celebrated. Sammy and his sister visited Joe in California for a reunion. That night, Joe told Sammy about his dream. I dreamed that I was you in a cell. It was a dark, black, and burgundy tile with this little window way up high. Sammy was stunned. Joe's words took him back, back to the horror of captivity. When the Iraqis were taking Sammy to a POW camp, he had been handcuffed so tightly that his wrists were cut and bleeding. The pain, I hardly can move my wrists around. I had the handcuffs for five long days, you know, very tight and really hurting my wrist badly. I had this beige and green striped cloth, which was really important to me. The detail was astonishing. Joe was describing Sammy's blanket, the only comfort he had. It was very cold, so I usually just have the blanket around me because it was keeping me warm. You've described my cell exactly. 
Joe and Sammy compared notes for hours. And even the cloth, and that was my. I was totally amazed, surprised. His dream matched the cell and the reality uh, almost, let me say, 100%, you know, 100%. The feeling, the description, the colors, how I felt, uh, everything. Maybe Joe's dream was just an eerie coincidence. Or maybe some dreams are real in ways that we don't understand. Or perhaps Joe's dream is proof that friendship transcends the limits of time, distance, or dimension. For more than three years, he was a man without a past caught in the unforgiving grip of amnesia. Would he ever find his true identity? Imagine you are awakened by a stranger on a distant roadside. You have no idea who you are, where you are, or how you got there. Tristan, you sound like you know your name. He asked me who I was and what I was doing here, and I didn't have a clue. Everything was blank from the moment uh, I saw his face, and that was really scary. Here, let's lean you up against my pack, buddy. Come on. I had a bunch of lumps on the back of my head, and there were bruises inside my elbows, like somebody tied me up. What happened? When I was awake enough, he told me that I'd been saying uh, three names, Pat and Chris and Joel. And uh, that's how I got my name, basically. He picked the name Pat and got cleaned up at a local shelter. Then he went to the police. Yes, sir, may I help you? Boy, I sure hope so. Uh, I think I've been hit on the back of the head. I've got a couple of big bumps back there, but the thing is, I don't remember anything about my life. I don't remember my name or anything. Do you have any identification on you or no, something you know, with your picture when on When I woke up, all I had was this comb and 23 cents. Okay. A closer look revealed that Pat had a callus on his ring finger. Perhaps he had once worn a wedding band. Can I get you to step around the corner here, please? They took my fingerprints, but they didn't find anything. Evidently, I'd not wanted for anything, and I didn't match any missing persons descriptions. But I didn't have any more clues as to who I was. It's the worst case of amnesia I've ever seen by far. We're not sure of the cause of his amnesia. He tells us that he suffered an injury to the head and that his memory for all events in his life prior to that head injury are gone. Pat didn't know who he was, but he knew that he had to take care of himself. Without identification, he couldn't get a job in Cheyenne. So he set out for Jackson Hole, 450 miles away. He had heard about work there that did not require ID. Pat landed a job at a local newspaper. But even as he began a new life, pieces of his old life started to surface. One day, out of the blue, he remembered a date. December 31st, 1949. Could it be his birthday? He called Social Security, but got nothing. Uh, the name I'm using is Pat Brown. There is a sadness about Pat. There's something missing, and I know he feels it. It's a void. It's a darkness that he can't see through, and I feel for him. Gradually, other cryptic clues began to emerge. One day at work, I was adding up the figures on one of the monthly reports, and somebody said, how do you do that? I said, do what? How can you run an adding machine without looking at the keys? I, I don't know, it, it just, just does. <laughs> when Pat saw a movie that was set in the city of Chicago, he was sure that he had been there before. I need to see a picture ID, please. Okay. But without a passport or driver's license, Pat wasn't allowed to board the plane. Not being able to fly to Chicago was really disappointing because that was a clue to my past. And I don't know of any other quick way to get there. Pat's true identity 
remained a mystery. But another clue emerged. A reoccurring dream might be the key to the life he had lost. I'm in a shower. It's like a campground shower. The little boy comes running up and says, Dad, Dad, Mom and Chris need you. I think Chris is hurt. I tell him, OK, Joel, I'll dry off and be right there. And that's when I wake up. And it comes so often that I'm pretty sure it's a memory and not just a dream. Chris and Joel were the names Pat kept repeating when he was found by the hitchhiker. I'm pretty sure I have a family out there, and I hope they love me and miss me and want to see me back, because I, I know I, I love them. Of necessity, I've basically started over from scratch. I came to with 23 cents in a comb, and now I've got a little bank account. And the, the only thing that's really missing is, is a past and, and the family I think I had. Update. On the night of our broadcast, we learned that the man who had no name or past turned out to have a family. They called Unsolved Mysteries and said Pat's real name is Carl Brodnick. His wife and sons immediately flew from Indianapolis for their long-awaited reunion. Do you know me? Do you? <laughs> but also waiting for Brodnick was a warrant for his arrest. After the reunion, he flew home to Indiana with his family to face embezzlement charges. Carol Brodnick was sentenced to 100 days home detention and 200 hours of community service. In addition, he was required to repay the company for the money he embezzled. Carl has served his time and has paid his debt. If you have any information on any of the other cases featured on the program, log on to unsolved.com.